medical doctor. He is also, um, he, he joined Wayne State University School of Medicine faculty in 1996. He's the director of the Wayne State University Movement Disorder Center and also the director of the Movement Disorder Clinic at the John D. V, uh, John D. Dingle VA Medical Center. Uh, he serves on the Movement Disorder Strategic Planning Committee of the American Academy of Neurology, and he's also the co-director of the Neurophysiology Curriculum for Wayne State University School of Medicine. I give you Dr. George. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me adjust this a bit. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. <clears throat> so this is... Uh, going to focus mostly on issues that become uh, more critical as Parkinson's advances. And we have a list of what I'd like to talk about. Uh, many of these are, of course, issues that can come up in earlier Parkinson's, but they tend to become more severe as uh, the disease progresses and the management becomes more complicated in later stages of disease. So we'll start with uh, <clears throat> balance and falls, uh, and related to that is, of course, orthostatic hypotension, which also causes falls. Then we'll move into memory and hallucinations. All of these are things that have been addressed to some degree in some of the other uh, talks today, but uh, with uh, more of a focus on uh, throughout the course of disease. Uh, and the same thing with motor fluctuations. Swallowing problems also were addressed earlier but become uh, particularly an issue in late disease. And then probably the only topic that's uh, specific to this talk is uh, long-term and hospice care. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> one of the first things that uh, people address when uh, you begin developing balance problems is uh, using canes. Uh, a lot of times people will go out and just get a straight cane. Straight canes are great for taking the weight off of one leg. So if you have a bad knee or a problem with one leg, then a straight cane can be very useful. Its ability to help you maintain your balance, though, is somewhat limited. People do use them to help with balance, um, but uh, really uh, quad canes give you a lot more stability. And they don't all have four feet, but you know these are the canes that go down and, ha and typically have like a little platform with three or four feet to give more stability uh, and uh, <clears throat> can be much more useful. They're also particularly useful for getting up and down stairs. Uh, and generally, it helps to have a therapist go over the, the cane you've got, make sure that it's the right length, make sure that... Uh, and people know how to use the, uh, the cane most appropriately. This also is sort of in the early stages where balance becomes a problem. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things uh, important to remind uh, care providers is to start working on balance issues early. Uh, one of the things that comes up is that you can no longer simply step into your clothes standing up when you're getting dressed. You can't easily reach and bend over for things. And these are things you've been, that people have been doing for 30, 40 years uh, or longer before they reach the point where they have to remember not to try and do them. So it's good to start uh, changing those habits that you know, if you're going to actually reach, which gets your center of gravity off balance, or if you're going to bend over, you need to be holding on to something that's stable to help support the balance. And when you're doing things like dressing, you need to have uh, arrangements where you can sit down to put on things like uh, pants uh, and then stand up to pull them up rather than try and balance on one foot and step into them. But when balance really becomes a problem, uh, generally we move to using walkers. And one of the issues that comes up a lot are uh, <clears throat> that uh, if you just get a walker from uh, the average primary care person, you're liable to end up with one of these types of walkers, either no wheels or just little wheels added to the front of a lightweight uh, aluminum walker. Um, these are very difficult for people with Parkinson's to use. You can't 
coordinate picking up and moving a walker as you walk as easily and even tilting it to, to roll, they don't provide as much stability as you'd really like for people with Parkinson's. And they're no help at all for falling backwards, which is often a big problem in Parkinson's disease. Um, so you get uh, people who end up, uh, since the, the walker weighs nothing, they just fall over backwards still holding the walker, uh, which is not a good idea. So typically what you want for someone with Parkinson's is either a rollator or better yet, the U-step type. Uh, the rollator you see uh, to your left up there. Uh, these are easy to use. They have the handbrakes, uh, much more stability. Uh, <clears throat> there's some assistance for falling backwards because they at least have some weight to them to help you uh, <clears throat> keep your weight forward. But they still have problems. They can get away by rolling too easily if you haven't got a good grip on the handbrakes. Uh, <clears throat> they can uh, still uh, let you have festination, which is the situation where you end up walking faster and faster. And the walker will go faster and faster unless you manage to try and slow it down with the handbrakes. So the U-step type is uh, a much, much better type. You see it on the right. It has reverse action brakes, so you have to squeeze the brakes to go. So at any point you're starting to lose your balance, you don't have to think to grab the brakes. You just let go of the brakes and hold on to the walker, it's going to stop. Um, <clears throat> it also has much better stability. It's got this U base that you see there with uh, multiple wheels, including two little wheels that are actually slightly behind you. So it provides good stability against falling backwards. And it actually has an adjustment for variable resistance on the wheels so that you can adjust it so that it won't roll too easily and get away. It will help to prevent people from festinating and going faster and faster. Um, <clears throat> so it's important to, uh, when you need a walker, make sure you get the right type of walker for good safety. If you reach the point where uh, you are not safe even with the walker, then we have to consider uh, power mobility. Um, and you have two choices here, power wheelchairs and power scooters. The uh, power wheelchairs are much more maneuverable. Uh, some of them will just spin on a spot if you want to. Um, so they're uh, very nice for getting around indoors and in tight spaces but they're not as well uh, set up for going long distances or traveling outside. Power scooters, on the other hand, are better if you want something that you can use to, for outside the home to go uh, long distances, but they're not very maneuverable for inside the home. And so for physicians, uh, I really recommend that uh, patients be referred to therapists who are uh, good at power mobility and can really go over with patients what they're, how they plan to use the uh, device, uh, <clears throat> what, their, what their routines are, what they can do, and not just uh, give them a prescription and have them go to a place that sells what they like to sell uh, and doesn't necessarily go over all the options and really uh, choose the device appropriate for the patient. Now, not really related to uh, balance and falls. We also have on the bottom of this slide home safety. But <clears throat> as uh, balance uh, becomes more and more of a problem, you want to look at a number of home safety issues like uh, carpets on the floor, uh, really uh, padded or uh, deep shag type carpets are harder to, to walk. You need to uh, make sure that the home is arranged with some open space for, for getting around, uh, particularly if you're going to have to use a device like a walker, but also has uh, reasonable arrangements so that you can get hold of things when you, when you need to to help uh, maintain the balance. Uh, <clears throat> additionally, this is uh, the time as people begin to have more mobility problems where bed mobility becomes a big issue. 
and hospital beds can be useful at this stage. And they're particularly uh, a particular consideration for uh, a good hospital bed is whether it has an arrangement to put a trapeze bar on it. So a tra trapeze bar is hanging down from uh, uh, <clears throat> above that you can grab hold of and help to move around in the bed and help to get in and out of the bed. And this is extremely useful for patients uh, trying to adjust their position in bed and to get out of bed when they have limited mobility. So it's one of those things you want to consider uh, before you uh, purchase a bed or arrange for a bed. And then other sorts of uh, arrangements in the living situation, uh, the durable medical equipment, this is where you want to make sure there are grab bars, particularly in the bathroom, but other places where they may be important for safety, for preventing falls. So you want to address all of these things as the balance begins to become an issue, uh, hopefully not once falls become a problem because the goal is to really prevent falls. And if people are uh, falling with any regularity, I certainly have patients who tell me, oh yeah, I fall once a week, but I just get up and I keep going. Uh, that's true until the fall that breaks your hip or you land on something or land the wrong way. So you really want to be careful about falls as the disease progresses. So this brings us to orthostatic hypotension. And uh, this fits into falls because sometimes you get people who are falling and they still seem to have pretty reasonable balance. You do a pull test in the office and they can uh, recover. Uh, you ask them about the falls. Some people are tripping over something or they're overbalancing because they're reaching and they need to work on, again, those safety habits to keep from getting off balance. But if none of those are the case, then people may be having orthostatic hypotension even if they don't give you a clear story. Uh, most physicians, if somebody says, well, I fell because I got lightheaded and dizzy, they're going to think right away of uh, orthostatic hypertension, but that's not always uh, the story that you get, uh, even though orthostatic hypertension may be the issue. And certainly anybody who falls while using their walker, um, you have to suspect orthostatic hypertension because if you get lightheaded and weak and can't hold on to the walker, it's certainly not going to hold you up. Uh, <clears throat> now there are exceptions to this. I had. Uh, a patient the other day who fell going outside to get in the car. And I said, well, were you using the walker? And uh, he said, well, yes. And his daughter said, not really. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, he got frustrated with the walker and threw it across the yard. Then he fell. <laughs> um, so obviously, uh, walkers can be very frustrating. But uh, if you're using the walker properly and you still manage to fall, um, then we have to get quite uh, suspicious. Mm -hmm. And really about 18% of folks with Parkinson's will have symptomatic uh, orthostatic hypotension as the disease progresses. Uh, if you see a lot of orthostatic hypotension very early in disease, it may mean that it's uh, uh, multiple system atrophy or some other diagnosis than regular Parkinson's disease, or it may be related to medications. Um, but uh, as the uh, disease progresses, more and more people do develop significant problems. And just to remind people, orthostatic hypotension is defined as a sustained drop in the systolic blood pressure of more than 20 or in the diastolic blood pressure of more than 10 within three minutes of standing. And this is an important issue for providers who are trying to make the diagnosis it's important that people lie flat for ideally five minutes, but a good length of time before you do the test. And then you have people sit up and get their blood pressure again, and then you have them stand up. And what often happens is people get the blood pressure as soon as the patient stands up, or better, at one minute. We typically do check the blood pressure at one minute. And certainly if the blood pressure has dropped when you do that, check at one minute, then you've uh, established that there's uh, orthostatic hypertension. But many patients, there's more of a delay 
before the blood pressure drops. And so what you need to do is time another two minutes after that first one minute blood pressure. If at any point the patient develops symptoms, either lightheadedness or whatever it, symptoms they say they have when they fall, you get another blood pressure at that point or get another blood pressure at three minutes um, to make sure whether you're really dealing with the orthostatic hypotension. And again, the definition is in terms of the drop in the blood pressure. If the blood pressure is high enough to start with, they, you may not become symptomatic even though you have a drop in the blood pressure. And that's why many patients have symptoms sometimes and not at other times. So when you're doing the, uh, the test in the office, uh, oftentimes people don't become symptomatic right when you do the test. It's helpful if they do. Um, but if you see the drop in uh, blood pressure, then you know you're dealing with orthostatic hypotension, even if there's no symptoms at the moment. And the symptoms can really be quite varied. So on this slide, which I stole from another presentation, we see all the different uh, symptoms. <clears throat> and uh, on the top left are the symptoms of decreased perfusion of the brain. And these include the classic dizziness, lightheadedness, uh, presyncope, feeling like you're going to pass out, syncope actually passing out, um, but can also just be sudden difficulty concentrating, uh, <clears throat> sudden uh, headache and a vague feeling that uh, makes it hard to, uh, to function properly. Um, you can also, on the other side at the top, have uh, retinal hypo hypoperfusion. The <clears throat> pressure inside the eye is actually higher in the vitreous than in the brain. So you need more blood pressure to keep blood flowing through your, uh, your retina in your eye. So just a, a drop in blood pressure that doesn't really cause a problem for the brain can still cause your vision to get uh, if it's severe, grayed out, but sometimes just a little blurry and indistinct. Uh, <clears throat> people also have problems with decreased uh, perfusion in the lungs. They'll <clears throat> have a drop in blood pressure that causes them to get short of breath, and people don't always think of the fact that this may be uh, due to uh, orthostatic hypotension, particularly if it happens fairly soon after getting up. I mean, we have lots of people who get up and after they walk for a while, they start to get short of breath. But uh, if it's happening uh, fairly soon after getting up and not related to just how much exertion has gone on, you want to think about, well, could this be uh, orthostatic hypotension? And of course, people who get uh, chest pain from overworking the heart may get it in response to the blood pressure change. Finally, over on the other side, uh, you can have problems with just decreased uh, perfusion to your muscles. And this is mostly the muscles in your shoulders and your arms, because they're the ones that are highest up and don't get uh, good perfusion. So people will complain of aching pain that suddenly comes on in their um, shoulders and upper back uh, when they've been up and about for a while. And that can be a symptom of uh, orthostatic hypotension. The slide calls it uh, coat hanger ache, because the aching is really uh, around the region that the coat hanger supports the coat. And then finally, you can get all sorts of generalized things. You can just get generalized weakness. You can feel like your legs are giving out. Um, you can get sudden onset of fatigue that's because of the decrease in uh, blood pressure and perfusion. So the, there's a lot of things that can go on and be symptoms that the blood pressure is not being maintained well and uh, may lead to, to falls and to other problems. So if you identify orthostatic hypotension, what do you do about it? I often hear patients complain, well, whatever happens, the doctor just wants to write a prescription and send me out of the office. Um, often we do have to use medications for uh, orthostatic hypotension, but you want to start with non-medication uh, treatment. Uh, the first thing is just getting up slowly and waiting for a while before you walk, because many people will get the drop within three minutes of getting up, 
but after five minutes, they begin to equilibrate and can, can get on better. So you want to be careful not to sort of leap up and go uh, <clears throat> if you're starting to have this kind of a problem because that will definitely lead to increased falls. The other thing is to increase salt and fluid intake. And actually not on the slide, but uh, the first sort of uh, medical treatment, many patients are on medications to lower their blood pressure that they've had to use for years. And so uh, one of the first things you want to do is back off on uh, blood pressure lowering medications. You don't need the medication suppressing your blood pressure uh, at this point. And what goes along with that is that uh, people are on low salt diets to try and keep their blood pressure down. Well, you don't want to keep the blood pressure down if going too low is a problem. So you need to, to liberalize the salt in the diet. Make sure you drink plenty of fluid because if you do get volume depleted, that will make uh, orthostatic hypotension worse. Uh, another thing to do is to keep the bed in reverse Trendelenburg. Uh, Dr. Trendelenburg uh, described uh, uh, putting beds in positions with the feet up to increase blood flow to the uh, head, but reverse Trendelenburg is the opposite. You want the bed on a slight slope uh, with the <clears throat> head above the feet uh, about a 10 to 20 degree slope. You don't want too much of a slope or people feel like they're sliding out of the bed and they even will slide out of the bed. Uh, a lot of times people say, oh, put up the head of the bed, particularly if you've got a hospital bed where you can do that. That's not very effective. What's gonna make the difference is how much higher your heart is above your feet. So if you've got a bed that folds in the middle and you're bending at the waist, First of all, your heart's only halfway up your trunk. So if you're elevating, you know, unless you're sitting upright, your heart's not going to be that much higher um, just from sit sitting up the head of the bed. And your feet are still going to be at the same level. So what you really want is the bed to be fairly flat, but the whole thing tilted so that the head is above the uh, level of the feet. And this is most easily done with a non-hospital bed. You just get uh, something uh, solid like uh, bricks or four by four chunk of wood and put it under the feet at the head of the bed to, to provide a tilt. And this does a couple of things. One is um, you, you, when you lie flat and your, blood, your body doesn't have to tighten up the blood vessels to keep the blood, ve the blood from flowing to your feet, then those blood vessels all totally relax. And then once you've done that overnight and you go to get up, you gotta get that vascular tone back, get the, the tension in the blood vessels back. If you're on a slight slope overnight so there's still a tendency of the blood to flow to the feet, then the blood vessels will maintain their tone and you don't have to get it going again in the morning. Another issue is that uh, <clears throat> when you uh, lie flat, the fluid that has been trying to hang out in the lower extremities because of the uh, orthostatic hypotension and decreased vascular tone is now all happily running all over the body and coming up to the kidneys where <clears throat> you start making urine because your kidneys say, oh, we've got more volume than we want. Uh, <clears throat> this results in two things. One, worse nocturia. You're getting out of bed all night because you have to <clears throat> go urinate again. And second of all, by morning, your volume depleted, particularly once you stand up and most of your fluid starts trying to shift down to your lower extremities again. So just keeping that slight slope will make a big difference with those. In addition, people with orthostatic hypotension develop supine hypertension. So when you're upright, your blood pressure is dropping. Your body tries to compensate. It does hang on to more fluid. It'll hang on to more salt if you take it. Um, it does other things to adjust the blood pressure setting so the blood pressure won't go too low. Then when you lie down and it doesn't have to fight gravity anymore, your blood pressure can shoot way up. Um, so by being on that little slope, you avoid that increase in supine blood pressure, which also can be even worse if you do end up being on medication for orthostatic hypotension. Other things you want to do, avoiding large meals and excessive caffeine use. Uh, large meal, your body says, oh, 
lots of digestion going on. Let's send all the blood to the stomach and intestines. And there's less blood around to maintain your blood pressure for being upright on your feet. So orthostatic hypotension will be worse after uh, a large meal. Caffeine also has an adverse effect. So if you can cut back on the caffeine, you'll do better. Caffeine also has a slight uh, diuretic effect. So you'll tend to lose uh, fluid volume with caffeine. Um, finally, uh, wearing compression stockings in particular, an abdominal binder helps as well. This mechanically supplements the vascular tone in the lower extremities and keeps those blood vessels tight so that the blood can't uh, all hang out in the lower extremities and cause the orthostatic hypotension. And this is something that seems to be forgotten a lot for several reasons. Uh, providers often forget to, uh, to prescribe a good compression hose, but they can be very helpful. Uh, when they are prescribed, oftentimes patients aren't well informed about uh, what the purpose of the uh, compression hose are. And I get people who aren't wearing them, and were you given them? Oh, yes, well, <clears throat> it would really help your uh, <clears throat> tendency to pass out when you're up on your feet. Oh, nobody ever told me that was what they were for. So you have to make sure that people have them and they know to use them. Unfortunately, they are very uncomfortable, particularly in hot weather as we're getting into now, but uh, not as uncomfortable as uh, falling down and uh, breaking your hip or doing a face plant on the sidewalk. So uh, you have to really try and make sure people wear them when they need them. Non-medical treatments aren't adequate, then uh, we want to uh, go for uh, medications. And uh, this is a, a basic table of the medications that are most often used to, to treat problems with orthostatic hypotension. Um, two of them at your far left, uh, fludrocortisone, brand name Florinef, and uh, not, not quite all the way to the right, Desmopress and DDAVP, are basically drugs that act to keep salt and fluid in the body. So they will help to increase the volume and maintain the blood pressure. They have the drawback that they're long acting. Uh, not necessarily that the drug hangs around all that long, but once you've retained extra salt and fluid and expanded your volume, it's gonna stay that way until uh, your body eliminates that extra fluid. So these are more likely to cause problems with high blood pressure at night, the supine hypertension. Uh, so you wanna be careful about that. They also uh, can cause congestive heart failure in people who are susceptible to that, which uh, a lot of advanced Parkinson's patients do have some degree of cardiac issues. So <clears throat> they're useful, but have to be used quite gingerly. Uh, the two that probably are the ones that most people start with are either midodrin or droxydopa. Uh, both of these act to tighten up the blood vessels and maintain the blood pressure. Midodrin has a direct effect on the blood, pre on the blood vessels. Um, <clears throat> and it's short acting, so you usually have to take it three times a day, but that means you can time it so that it wears off when you go to bed at night and doesn't keep the blood pressure so high at night. Uh, the droxydopa is uh, a drug that's converted to norepinephrine which is what the body releases to tighten up the blood vessels and try and prevent uh, orthostatic hypotension. So it's got a little bit of an advantage. The midodrin's gonna tighten the blood vessels all the time. The droxydopa will enhance the, the body's regulation of the tightness of the blood vessels as well as tightening them up. Um, but it's more expensive and harder to get, so most people don't start with that. Uh, pyridostigmine and octreotide. Pyridostigmine acts uh, on the uh, pre-ganglionic nervous system to activate the tightening of the blood vessels. It's a relatively mild effect, but uh, it can, uh, can be effective, uh, but you, it's a, not a strong effect. Uh, you can't push it very far. Or you run into problems with uh, diarrhea in particular. And octreotide uh, affects the blood, vessel, the blood flow to the stomach and intestine, so it helps with that uh, effect of uh, more orthostasis after eating. 
Um, but uh, again, it has a, a limited use. So that's orthostatic hypotension as related to falls. And again, memory and hallucinations has been a topic of uh, part of some other lectures. Uh, but again, this tends to come more into play as Parkinson's advances. Uh, <clears throat> the average duration of Parkinson's disease before developing signs of dementia is about 11 years. Uh, you can get medication-related hallucinations at any time, even in non-Parkinson's patients, actually. We see that in the, uh, in the hospital sometimes. But uh, <clears throat> significant problems with developing hallucinations easily and in response to the Parkinson's medications often parallel the uh, timing of onset of dementia. And just flip ahead. So this is from the Sydney study where they followed a large number of Parkinson's patients over many years, uh, showing that the stepwise but gradual onset of indications of dementia uh, and uh, hallucinations is the dotted line. And you can see they parallel very nicely. They cross the 50% point if you average them into a straight line, right about 11 years. Um, you do get some people who develop uh, cognitive and memory problems and uh, hallucination problems earlier in, di in disease, and some people go quite late. Um, obviously, the, uh, the plot hasn't reached zero even at 20 years, so there are people who are doing fine mentally after 20 years of Parkinson's. But once you get beyond a decade, you're going to see more and more people having these sorts of problems. And because the hallucinations can be related to Parkinson's medication and the uh, drugs that we use to try and improve cognition, the central acetylcholinesterase inhibitors act to upregulate uh, <clears throat> acetylcholine. Uh, you know, one of the types of drugs we use to treat particularly tremor but also other Parkinson's disease symptoms are anticholinergics. So if you give these drugs to improve memory and cognition, you may be causing more tremor, more uh, movement problems. So you sometimes get into a bind of, uh, okay, we've got to not do as well with movement as we'd like uh, because we're going to make the, the memory and cognition um, worse. And I sometimes end up saying to people, well, would you rather be seeing things that aren't there or would you rather shake? Um, you know, it's probably better to shake and not be seeing things that, that aren't real and having memory problems. Uh, but you have to balance the trade-off. So uh, again, the average time to development of signs of dementia is about 11 years. By 15 years, uh, almost half of uh, people with Parkinson's have evidence of dementia. Uh, Another uh, roughly a third have what's called a mild cognitive impairment, just short of dementia. But 15% still have no cognitive impairment. By 20 years, uh, you know, more than 80% have some evidence of dementia. So as the disease progresses, it's, it's definitely a hurdle that you have to address. On the other hand, sometimes people get accused of having cognitive problems and memory problems when they don't. Uh, if uh, people are being assessed in a busy primary care office, um, some people may be responding slowly and people conclude that they can't answer the question when they just didn't wait long enough to hear the answer. The lack of facial expression that comes from the reduced uh, facial mobility in Parkinson's sometimes leads uh, people to conclude that patients don't understand what they're being told when they understand just fine, they just, uh, you just can't see it in their face so easily. Uh, speech difficulties can make it harder to uh, uh, assess how well people are doing in terms of memory and thought processes. And then finally, some of the uh, tasks that are frequently used to assess memory problems, like uh, drawing a cube and drawing a, a clock face, uh, the motor problems of Parkinson's may make these hard to do when the cognition is still fine. Another thing is the frequency of depression 
in people with Parkinson's can make people perform as if they have memory and cognition problems, but really they have uh, more easily treated depression that will improve their functioning. Uh, so you always need to be aware of that and assess for that. With hallucinations, some people just have uh, some really benign uh, hallucinations. They see something that they find amusing and they know it's not real and they can ignore it. And there's no reason to give people drugs to, to try and get rid of that. Um, just to reassure them that it's uh, not unexpected, but that they should uh, be sure and let you know if they develop more severe problems with hallucinations. Uh, but many people do get either frightening hallucinations or upsetting. Uh, frequently, people end up uh, seeing and talking to family members who, who died years before, and that can uh, be a real downer, even if it's not scary. Um, <clears throat> and uh, sometimes people see things that they just don't know aren't real, and that can lead them to do things that uh, are unwise or not safe. Uh, the mainstay of treatment are atypical uh, neuroleptics. Uh, <clears throat> some of the uh, atypical neuroleptics, particularly risperidone, almost always make Parkinsonian symptoms worse, so you want to try and avoid those drugs. Uh, olanzapine is uh, Zyprexa. It's sort of right in the middle. Um, sometimes you can get away with it in low doses without making Parkinson's worse. Most people use quetiapine, Seroquel, as the uh, first choice. Clozapine's even better, uh, but if you're familiar with clozapine, it can have a serious effect on the bone marrow and production of blood cells, so you have to have blood tests uh, very frequently, weekly, every two weeks after a while. Um, so most people avoid uh, using that, uh, but uh, it's probably the best thing to use if you have to. And then the newest uh, kid on the block is Pimavanserin, new Plazid. You may have seen they've run some rather scary TV commercials recently. Uh, but that's a drug that's specifically indicated for hallucinations in Parkinson's and doesn't seem to make uh, Parkinson's movement and motor function worse. Again, it's uh, expensive and harder to get hold of, so most people still start with uh, quetiapine as the, the first line, but uh, it's a good uh, option if you need it. So this is just a slide from another talk uh, that lists uh, non-motor complications of late Parkinson's. And you can see most of them are things we've already talked about, from cognitive, <clears throat> slowing dementia, psychosis, depression, dysregulation of blood pressure, particularly the orthostatic hypotension. I'm not going to say much about dysregulation of bowel and bladder, particularly constipation and sleep disturbances. These are all non-motor symptoms that can be big issues for a lot of people throughout the course of Parkinson's, and they become more likely to be an issue in later Parkinson's as well. So you definitely need to be cognizant of them. Finally, motor uh, fluctuations in advanced Parkinson's disease. Again, um, a topic uh, for several of the earlier talks, many people get into motor fluctuations and peak dose dyskinesia and end up having deep brain stimulation uh, <clears throat> earlier in the disease, but uh, these things become more prevalent as the disease progresses, and often by the time uh, you're in late stage disease and motor fluctuations become a real problem, there's uh, not uh, a good option for deep brain stimulation. Uh, you may not be a candidate because of declining cognition or because of other comorbid diseases, um, heart problems, lung problems. I've seen limit people from getting deep brain stimulation. On the other hand, there's no absolute age limit. So sometimes people say, oh, over 70 years of age, you can't have DBS. That, that's not true. It depends on your state and your condition. And even in late stage, some people can have uh, deep brain stimulation, but many people can't. And then we have to play other games. Uh, the time-release capsules of carbidopa, levodopa, 
can be very helpful, but they're often hard to get. A lot of insurance either doesn't cover them or their latest thing is to say, oh yes, it's covered. You can pay most of the cost as a copay and we'll pick up a little bit, which isn't really covering it in my opinion, but um, it certainly prevents a lot of people from, from getting the medication. And then some of the other things that we use throughout the course of disease, apomorphine injections for sudden offs, uh, <clears throat> regular and long-acting amantadine to suppress peak dose dyskinesia, all can be used in later disease. But again, uh, you're more likely to run into problems with uh, cognition and hallucinations using these in later diseases. And probably one of the best options at this point is the continuous intestinal administration of carbidopa levodopa as a gel, the Duopa pump. So patients who really would be candidates for deep brain stimulation but can't have it in late disease should certainly uh, consider this as an option. Um, sometimes people say, well, it's late stage disease, they're stuck in a wheelchair, um, it's not, you know, you don't, you don't need to give them medication to um, <clears throat> help the movement. And uh, so I throw this slide in here. Uh, it, it's unpleasant even in a wheelchair to be totally unable to move. Um, so if you can relieve people from being fully off, even if they're already at the point of being in a wheelchair all the time, it's important to do so. Uh, and again, symptoms of wearing off are not necessarily the obvious ones you think of. We think of slowness of movement and immobility. But people can have things like dystonias, um, muscle cramping, uh, abdominal discomfort, uh, irritability, anxiety, shortness of breath. Um, you see this whole, whole long list here uh, of things that can go on uh, as the uh, medication wears off, which can also make it uh, very unpleasant to be off even if it's not a motor issue. So here's the uh, <clears throat> time release capsule formulation I mentioned earlier. I threw this in, uh, those of you who are prescribers will perhaps be aware that if you look it up, you see these nice tables of how much should be dosed on a three times a day, four times a day uh, basis. That can work for many patients, but many other patients uh, really don't fit the table and they won't be happy and they'll say writery doesn't work for them. Uh, so you really want to prescribe it where the uh, total daily levodopa dose from the time release capsules should be equal to 1.8 to two times the levodopa equivalent dose of all the other medications. Uh, you know, if they're on uh, the uh, agonists, if they're using Comtan, things like that, you have to take it into account. And then divide up the doses so that the individual doses contain about three times the levodopa content that you give the patient for immediate release to get a good response and not peak dose dyskinesia. And this uh, means that it won't fit the table and often will be dosed more than just three or four times a day, but far less often than immediate release and with better effect in avoiding the uh, fluctuations. The other thing, the uh, Duopa, I mentioned earlier, this is the Carbidopa Levodopa gel. It gets pumped continuously into the intestinal tract um, through a tube. And uh, again, this can be very effective at avoiding fluctuations and on and off effects uh, in late stage disease. And it brings us to swallowing problems. Swallowing problems become a big issue, uh, particularly in late disease. Aspiration, getting stuff in your lungs is a major risk. And anybody who chokes on uh, food or has chronic coughing, especially if they're coughing after meals, needs to have a modified barium swallow test to see if they're able to safely swallow. A lot of times uh, people, patients, and caregivers don't realize that uh, they say, oh, the patient's developed a chronic cough as a, a reaction to one of the medications. Uh, and it's only when you start paying attention that you realize that the coughing starts after every meal and gradually dies down but may not be gone by the next meal because you're getting a little bit of stuff in your lungs every time you eat and drink. And then we need to do something about that before you get pneumonia. 
Some people don't cough. They have silent aspiration. So anybody who does get pneumonia needs a modified barium swallow to see if they're getting stuff in their lungs and, and nobody knew it. Uh, a lot of the time, we can deal with these problems by adding thicker, thickeners to liquids, having a speech therapist teach good swallowing techniques. Uh, <clears throat> but eventually, some people simply cannot safely swallow or safely swallow enough nutrition, um, and you may want to consider a PEG tube. Um, if you get to that point, you should seriously consider using a PEG tube that's uh, suitable for the Duopa gel. Um, crushing uh, carbidopa levodopa tablets and trying to flush them down tubes uh, works for a few days if somebody ends up with an NG tube in the hospital because they're NPO for some procedure. Uh, but it doesn't work well because the levodopa always ends up adhering to the wall of the tube. So you don't get the full dose, and you don't know how much of the dose you really get. And as the stuff adheres, it accumulates, and the tubes plug. So if you're doing something like a PEG tube where you're going to have a tube in long term, you're going to have to keep changing it because it keeps plugging if you go crushing uh, the carbidopa leva tablets and trying to put them down. Now, a simple solution is to simply dissolve the stuff before you put it down. You can dissolve carbidopa levodopa tablets in water. If you add something as a low pH buffer, generally vitamin C. Uh, the classic thing is uh, one gram or 10, 25, 100 or 10, 100 carbidopa levodopa pills in one liter of water with two 500 uh, milligram uh, vitamin C tablets, stir it until everything's dissolved. Uh, the problem with this is you have to keep the solution refrigerated. Uh, you can't store it even refrigerated for more than 24 hours, so you have to make up a new batch every day. And the dissolved liquid gets absorbed very quickly. So people who are having to take frequent doses of uh, <clears throat> pills and then they go on a tube are going to have to take even more frequent doses of the l dissolved liquid. So it's not generally a great solution, although it's it's conceptually easy to do, it's practically difficult to do. Um, so uh, now you can, if you can get the uh, writery, those time-release capsules, they have little time-release beads. You can open up the capsule and flush those beads down the tubes and they won't stick to the wall. And so that's a good solution, but uh, again, it's an expensive solution that's not uh, available to a lot of people because of insurance issues. Um, but if you're going to have a tube anyway, you might as well put in the type of tube that's used for the carbidopa levodopa gel. It has a separate uh, lumen that goes directly to the duodenum, uh, the best place to absorb carbidopa levodopa, and an extra lumen that ends in the stomach for, for feeding purposes. Um, so then you're all set. You just plug in a cartridge and get the thing programmed up. Uh, people are going to get the carbidopa levodopa they need, they're going to get it on a continuous basis, and you're going to have a tube for feeding. So these days, again, I think anybody with Parkinson's who needs, uh, is going to get a tube for feeding should get one that can be used with the uh, uh, duopa. I threw drooling in here. Um, it's related to swallowing problem. People drool basically because they have a decrease in spontaneous swallowing you accumulate saliva in your mouth. There are a number of things that are uh, done. One thing, there are a lot of drugs that we use for uh, bladder problems in uh, Parkinson's that may help reduce the drooling as well because they have an anticholinergic effect. There's also a pill that's a direct anticholinergic glycopyrrolate that can help to reduce uh, saliva production. But again, when you get to anticholinergics, you're doing the opposite of what the drugs that we use for memory problems and cognition do. And we're also uh, more likely to precipitate hallucination. So uh, using pills can be difficult. You can use uh, atropine or homatropine eye drops and just put them under the tongue um, where they'll act directly on the salivary glands and decrease saliva production. Uh, and that can be useful if you can get away with a small dose. But again, you have to be cautious. If you give too many drops through the course of the day, you're going to get systemic 
absorption and have the same problems with potential for hallucinations and so forth. So ultimately the best is to simply inject the salivary glands with botulinum toxin, which will decrease the saliva production for typically three or four months at a time, sometimes six months. Um, so just uh, a few injections uh, several times a year can keep the saliva production down. Yeah. So now we come to the uh, last topic is uh, what about hospice care? And why would you do hospice care? Well, there are actually a number of reasons to do it. Um, the second one on here, avoiding uh, ultimately futile care for infections and cardiac conditions. If uh, Parkinson's has become severe enough that the person with Parkinson's feels that you know, if something happens, they'd rather not come back from it. It doesn't mean you're ready to go, but you're not ready to be pulled back kicking and screaming if something does happen, uh, then that's definitely the time to consider hospice care. But also hospice can provide uh, more help at home if you do help ho home hospice. Um, you know, getting people to, to come in and help take care of somebody, particularly uh, with advanced Parkinson's, uh, taking care of people at home can be a, a major undertaking and paying for private duty nurses is expensive and insurance doesn't cover much, but hospice, uh, home hospice does cover a lot of home care. Um, so if you're at that point, uh, it's definitely worth considering as a way to keep people at home. And even in uh, a long-term care facility, uh, a hospice uh, situation has a much lower financial burden. Uh, that does take over from insurance. So when you're in hospice, you're not insured to be taken to the hospital and have CAT scans and things like that. So you have to take that into consideration. But uh, again, if you don't really want that kind of care, um, then you're much better off being in hospice and getting more money spent on the kind of care that you do want. Um, and finally, uh, though Parkinson's itself is not usually a particularly painful condition, many people do have problems with uh, chronic pain, particularly in later life, and hospice makes it much easier uh, to get pain medication, particularly in today's environment where uh, there's so many restrictions trying to cut down on the opioid epidemic, which we're all in favor of, but we are also in favor of people who really need the medication being able to get it and hospice can help you do that. So this is from a study of goals of care in end-stage Parkinson's disease. They were uh, talking to, to caregivers after uh, the person with Parkinson's had died. Um, before, the, before they reached that point, 87% uh, had a health care proxy, someone designated to make decisions if they couldn't. 92% had a living will, which is fantastic. And again, these are things that you need to think of before you get to the end stage. So uh, important to remind people with Parkinson's to address these issues while they're still not issues but can be addressed uh, with calm and thorough consideration and you're prepared when you get to the end stage. 79% wanted comfort care in the late stages, and only 6% wanted uh, life prolonging care. So again, uh, <clears throat> something like hospice is uh, a very good option if you don't want life prolonging care anymore. Um, the patient studies, none of them had CPR performed on them. 26%, a little over a quarter of them did have some tube feeding. 30% uh, received some sort of breathing support. And uh, most uh, three quarters basically felt that the wishes regarding the medical treatments had been followed, which is excellent. Uh, and more than half of the caregivers felt uh, that, uh, oh well, said that their uh, loved one had been in hospice care, though often only for a median of three weeks which probably indicates uh, putting people in hospice uh, much later than might be ideal. 
people who were in hospice, so it was uh, satisfaction with hospice care was uh, at the top of the ranking for satisfaction with health care. Um, patients enrolled in uh, hospice uh, were particularly satisfied, uh, well, the, their loved ones and caregivers were particularly satisfied in situations where they had really complicated uh, grief from the loss of the person with Parkinson's, which is another good consideration uh, for using hospice. Um, and there was, they looked to uh, see were people given uh, good uh, information about managing symptoms, because you still want to treat your Parkinson's and other medical problems that are chronic and not acute and uh, life-extending care. And uh, people were satisfied with, uh, with that and were given good information in hospice about that. Uh, folks who had long-term care but were not in hospice, 40% um, <clears throat> actually I think this is, this may be all, no, these are not in hospice, 40% uh, died while in a skilled nursing care or other long-term care facility. Uh, only one in four died at home, which a lot of people would prefer to do. Um, and that leaves 35% who wound up in an acute care hospital for something and then died. Um, nine Parkinson's patients in long-term care facilities uh, died without any family members or friends in attendance. All who remained at home had at least one significant person with them. That's obviously uh, a clear benefit of uh, being, being at home. Um, but also, even I can tell you, uh, inpatient hospice, they do a very good job of making sure that family are aware and can, can get there um, when uh, you get to the, the terminal stages, uh, which doesn't always get done. It's always done even in an acute care or a long-term care facility, but not necessarily with as much efficiency. So. Um, something to, to keep in mind, make sure that uh, uh, patients do address how they want their very final stages of disease cared for, that they have uh, the uh, living will and uh, uh, health care proxy and uh, consider uh, using hospice uh, to your advantage as you approach the end stages. Thank you. I see a question. Well, palliative care is the broader umbrella that includes uh, hospice care, and in fact is often used as a synonym for, for hospice care. Um, though you can get palliative care from uh, caregivers without being in hospice, uh, but it's still the, the same general plan, uh, but you don't have the uh, the structure and financial benefit of uh, being in hospice. Does that answer your question or did you? Okay. Uh, there's another question back there. Obviously, there's no prospective research about it prolonging life, but retrospectively, yes, uh, people who aspirate regularly tend to d die of pneumonia before too long, um, and you can look at that statistically. So preventing aspiration can prolong life. Um, most of the time in Parkinson's patients, the, the reason for considering tube feeding is um, because of uh, potential for aspiration. Uh, there are some cases where it's done because patients simply can't uh, voluntarily swallow enough nutrition. They, when they feed themselves, uh, they eat slowly enough that they'd have to eat 24 hours a day to maintain their nutritional status. Um, so those are, those are the main two reasons. Um, the Folks who are involved in palliative care and hospice often do, to some extent, discourage uh, 
uh, going to tube feedings and pegs and say, you know, if you're at the point where you feel if something takes you away, something takes you away, then you should go ahead and, and risk the aspiration and recognize that you probably will get pneumonia sooner or later. Um, but uh, that may be an acceptable uh, end of life. It's a, it's a tough decision. Uh, many people end up with the tube before that. Of course, some people, we end up using the Duopa, so we put in a tube where they're still able to eat just fine. Um, but because of bad fluctuations, you decide to go ahead with the Duopa. So that's a, another situation. Many people who do get tubes do it before they end up in a hospice situation. But it's always an individualized uh, choice of what you want to do. Was there another question up here? Have you seen yet a remote control device for the wheel, power wheelchairs and the scooters so that a uh, second person can operate it? Because with Parkinson's, sometimes you don't have enough control over your hands. Um, I haven't seen it as a remote control. I wouldn't say that there's not something out there. Uh, the power wheelchairs often have a joystick that's mounted right on the handle for the, park in the patient in the wheelchair to, to use. I have seen many caregivers simply walk alongside the wheelchair and manage the joystick themselves. Those joysticks actually could be taken off and mounted up by the handle behind if you wanted to walk behind the wheelchair. That could be done, but I haven't seen a remote control for it. Yeah, typically the tube has uh, two lumens, one that goes into the duodenum beyond the stomach for the duopa, and it always has an extra opening that could be used for feeding if you want to. There was another question. No, I think uh, that person left. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. I just wanted to make a comment. You mentioned speech pathology, and I would really encourage anyone who thinks they're getting into trouble with swallowing to get a really good speech pathology evaluation. There are so many things therapists can do to help. And even though Medicare has a cap, which they now call a trigger point, I apply a KX modifier all the time to extend the Medicare coverage and maybe only see a patient once a week to do thermal stem and help them keep their swallow. And that's a compelling reason for Medicare to extend the coverage because being able to keep the swallow safely is, is critically important in their life, right? <laughs> So um, just really encourage you to check it out really well because a lot more can be done for people than often mm -hmm. is in that respect. Very true. Uh, really quick. <laughs> Where they can't walk anymore? Um, I don't know an actual number for that. Uh, mm, it's a pretty vague idea, so I don't want to express it. I, I don't know actual numbers, but uh, you, you, you can get along very well not being able to walk if it's mostly that the balance is poor. So some people go a very long time. Other people, not being able to walk is associated with a lot of other symptoms that could shorten the life more dramatically. Requip, but he ended up in a rehab place where they overdosed him with it, and it, oh my goodness, it was horrible. And so we, we ended up just taking him off it completely. And then we, he was on another drug, I can't think of the name of it, isn't this terrible? <coughs> oh my goodness. In the very beginning, and it seemed to be helping, however, <coughs> he had constant jerking. I, at night, I could not count past 14 that he wasn't jerking, and we went through, they thought it was a sleep, uh, sleep apnea or something, so he had a sleep study done and all this stuff. We ended up stopping the medication, and it totally went away. It was just crazy. They tried him on Clonopin, he just throws up, could not function, so we've had our share of trials of drugs that have not worked for him. So was that early medication, Azalec? <laughs> Azalec, yeah. that was it, that was it, exactly, that was it. Which, yeah, and a lot of people, of course, tolerate that medication very well, but that's one of the issues when you get into these situations where 
medication is wearing off frequently and you try different things and you discover which things have side effects for you even though other people don't necessarily have them so that's why from Azalec to the to the right. well even and, even on the requip at one point when he was on it and things seemed to be okay he was put on Cipro for a bladder infection and I didn't read it until later but when you do that, you should have reduced the dose of Recrep. And we had a weekend where he was totally out of it, and he actually fell. We have a hole in our kitchen wall where he fell. I mean, it's just, but it was because of the, we should have come down on the Recrep dose, yeah. And did he have uh, peak dose dyskinesias, the uh, involuntary movements and moving around uh, no. after his doses? No. Okay. No. Because uh, that's another issue. Sometimes in order to keep people from wearing off, you're giving more more medication and you can't avoid having a lot of involuntary movements and that can also lead to falls and uh, causing other problems so it's a, another reason to consider uh, something like duopa and um, the other thing uh, in my earlier talk if you were there some of the other talks uh, you heard about uh, the uh, extended release capsules with the, the little time release beads um, which can help, and uh, also using drugs like uh, Comtan and Capone, either as a separate drug with the levodope to, to extend the duration, or you can get uh, a combination that has carbidopa, levodopa, and Capone all together called Stelevo. And I think we've tried to get him both the Stelevo and the, the Ritery, and the insurance just wouldn't go for it. Am I remembering right? Yes. Yeah. So <clears throat> that can uh, really put you up against the wall. So with all of this going on, uh, with the, the wearing off all the time and the frequent doses, uh, we talked about the Duopa and you decided you wanted to try that. Do um, you want to talk a little bit about how you went into that? Uh, you know, what, uh, what preparation and the, the surgery for the oh, two? Yeah. But, well, actually, for this two, we, we did meet with a um, GI doctor, and then it was an outpatient procedure. He went in, he had an outpatient procedure, and went home. We had a little issues with the first tube. He had leakage around it, and they did replace it with another, and, it, and, and that was fine. That took care of it. And uh, it's, um, it's, it's very easy to be, you know, they, the only thing you have to keep it in the refrigerator. And, uh, you, and it, so we have a refrigerator in our bedroom now. <laughs> so anyway, just but uh, it, it's worked very well. And the only thing I will say, if ever you had to go in a hospital with it, take the little connector they have because the hospital it's one that hospitals don't have. And when he ended up in the hospital, you need to flush it at night. And they did have enough, anything that would connect to it. And here I'm down at Harper, and we live in Farmington, so it's like, oh my gosh. So I'm all flustered, so I'm worried in the heck all night that it's going to clog up and not work, mm -hmm. but it does work if you don't flush it uh -huh. for one night. Uh -huh. I wouldn't advise don't it. Don't do it too frequently, don't do it, but, but once. It, Yeah, because I was so afraid to go the next morning, I thought we ruined it, and they, but it was fine. But take that adapter with you, because hospitals do not have that adapter, which is crazy, but you know they don't, yeah. Let me just point out, I left this slide up from the earlier talk because it uh, shows what's involved. The tube we're talking about is implanted uh, into, the, into the belly and uh, <clears throat> there's uh, a sort of little Y connection there you can see above the green part. So there's one uh, lumen of the tube that uh, can be used for feeding and so forth. And then the other one has the special connector that connects to this pump that you see the patient holding in their hand there. And the bottom part below the pump, the, the brown, is the little cartridge that actually has the gel in it that's going to gradually pump into the patient all day long. You don't have to refrigerate it when you're using it, but you have to store the cartridges. You use a new cartridge every day, and you have to store them refrigerated. Uh, so what uh, she was referring to is they have a little refrigerator in the bedroom to keep the cartridges in. So when it's time to start a new day and plug a new cartridge in, you've got it right there in the refrigerator. You don't have to go fetch it from the uh, kitchen refrigerator or anything Right, like it's, it saves running downstairs. Because <laughs> if I once I go down, the dogs are up and I have to put them out. And so <laughs> it's easier just to get it out in the room and get ready and go. <laughs> it was for ease. 
And then, uh, of course, the diagram shows the uh, sort of figurine holding the pump and the thing in their hand. Obviously, Steve doesn't go around all day with the thing in his hand. No, no. They actually have uh, a number of different uh, arrangements <coughs> for how to, to wear the pump. Uh, right, yeah, the Abbey Company, um, they sent us a brochure and they had several different choices of things you could use. You could have a fanny pack, a vest, which is what we chose. However, at a few times I have a fanny pack from other things that we've used for it because mm -hmm. it just seemed to more appropriate for that. And then it, it does come with a thing that hangs around your neck and it just hangs there. It comes with that, but you get to choose from several different um, art, articles of clothing that you, you decide to use it with. And you can have all three and use different oh, right, ones when, right. when you want, as seems suitable. Um, so you, you sometimes use a fanny pack, but it's not the one they supply. No, the, they gave us a choice of one thing, and I'm not sure if yeah. you can order them or not. So I had a fanny pack from a medication I had for my knee surgery, so we just use that yeah. periodically, yeah. Yeah, I, th I don't know if insurance will pay for more than one that you get when you get the device, but I'm sure you can order Oh, one. I'm sure. Yeah, you probably can. I just, yeah. just use the <laughs> fanny pack we have. Yeah, the, the device, the, well, the fanny pack in particular, I'm familiar with, but I think the best also, the, you know, there are nice arrangements of uh, uh, <clears throat> zippers and pockets and windows for access to the pump and having the tube come out in a, in a convenient spot and so forth. Sort of like uh, I don't know, my kids these days all have backpacks that have little openings for their earbuds to connect to whatever goes, goes in their backpack. So um, it's really, uh, I think, generally for most people, quite con convenient to wear it around. Yeah, oh yeah, it's not been a problem, no. Mm -hmm. And. Um, any other issues with it since? Uh... Well, he did get the tube. When you're not using it, the tube hangs out. It's about oh maybe almost a foot long, and he caught it between his knees when it one day and pulled and it pulled part of it off. So we ended up having to go back into the hospital and have another one put in. So and so since that we tape it. We're very careful. We have learned to tape it because it's much much easier to tape it than spend four days in the hospital. Yeah. So, the... so it's just little learning curves. The, the tube has some extension, so if you want to wear the fanny pack over on your hip or have your pump on uh, the, the strap hanging on your hip, the tube has to be able to reach over there. And if you've got something that holds the pump right over your belly, you don't need as much tube. Um, but any sort of tube like this, uh, if it comes out, you have to get it put right back in because uh, otherwise the body just heals up. Um, literally overnight and then you have to start from ground zero to to reinstall the tube. So how does the pump work? Is he able to, is it just continuous? Right, it's a continuous. It, it's, all set, it's all preset. All you do is hook it up in the morning, you turn it on and it goes through a thing and then you hit the, um, the run, it starts to hit start and then you give a morning dose which is like a booster dose and then after that's done it goes into a continuous mode. All, all day until you take it off. Yep. Positioning doesn't matter? Or if you get well, occasionally it'll kink. If, uh -huh. if it's kinked, it beeps at you right away so you can just go, go and fix it. it okay. it's, you know, it'll beep at you. And, uh, so you just hook it up in the morning and off you go. And Abby's been very good. They call a week before we're due to make sure FedEx brings it in the morning. They've always been there right when they say. So it's worked out very well um, for us. Yeah. And, and the batteries should change every week. I'm surprised that they don't last longer, but every they don't. Every week, but they send the batteries also. They provide the batteries, yeah. Now, predict, predicting battery life can be variable. You don't want the thing to oh, no. to run low, so they they replace them frequently, so that you've always got lots of juice to run the pump, and it'll deliver the right amount. And um, we program the pump in the office, so most people they, they don't recommend that you run it all night long. Um, there are issues with that one. You don't want to get tangled up in the tube in, this, in your sleep, but also uh, you don't want stuff when you're lying down running up and getting to your lungs instead of going down where we want it. So just the way you generally stop taking your pills overnight, you <clears throat> turn off the pump and as she mentioned, flush the tube out um, for, for the evening. 
and um, cap it with a special connector and then in the morning you have to hook it back up and so we program the pump to give uh, a fairly large dose over a period of about 20 minutes or so to get you going in the morning and then after that it just keeps feeding more in at low rates of, for the continuous and then in addition we have it uh, programmed we can say what dose but there's a button you can push for an extra dose in case you do experience some, some wearing off at times and uh, you know sometimes uh, people have better days than other days and they just need a little bit more you can push to get an extra boost of the gel delivered and then if you have to be pushing it every day uh, then we turn up the low rate the next time we program it so that uh, we try and keep it so it gives you the right amount but uh, you do have the option of getting a little extra when you need it anything else you think people should know about it we haven't had gone on a long trip yet but the company does send you a huge like a, a cooler padded cooler with ice things little ice things that you put in there and, and you can get I think a, I think a 10 day supply in there yeah. I think so, that's what she said yeah we haven't used it yet we only went on uh, we haven't gone anywhere that long but it, it, they do have a nice pack that you can carry it in so that you have, can carry your spare ones with you and they'll keep it'll keep cool so mm -hmm. and they provide that they just send it right to you if you're gonna be gone longer you can have more ship to where you are and then switch it back so yeah, that was my concern because I'm looking at to do a long cruise and I'm thinking I'm not going to have enough days here. <laughs> yeah, well, if you go on a cruise, I don't know that they're going to drop them off I by know, drones. That's, yeah. that's, <laughs> that's, 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 that's what I'm concerned about. Yeah, yeah right, I, exactly. I, I'm sure they'll be able to uh, give you enough to last for the whole cruise yeah. and uh, talk to the cruise people about keeping it appropriately refrigerated. So. Um, so, other questions? Yeah. I was just going to ask about the overnight. Do you have to provide any other medic medication coverage overnight? Well, we yeah. haven't been. The only thing I was thinking that maybe I should do, and I probably should, is give an extra dose before he goes, to, before we, we unhook it at night. Yeah. I've been thinking that might be a better idea. Because he does, he is able to get up, but he is, it, it is, he is very much impaired. But um, so you know maybe that even that giving that extra dose before we unhook it might be a you know. So how long is your night time? How long is he not on it? Is it ten hours, eight hours? Well, we usually go to bed around midnight, uh -huh. and we started around ten in the morning. Okay. Yeah, because mm -hmm. we sleep in. I mean. But it, it'll let you start it pretty much when, when you're ready to start um, yeah. in the morning. And uh, some people do take a, a dose of uh, something like the ropinerol that's more long acting or something like that at bedtime if they, if they need to. You're not, uh, it's not like you can't uh, take other stuff than, uh, than the duopa itself. And of course, one thing actually we ran into this, I think, at one point when you were in the hospital because you have a tube sometimes uh, nurses and uh, hospital physicians feel that you should be fed through the tube yeah. <laughs> and you can do that that's why there is the extra lumen but uh, for many people there's no no reason to uh, to use it as a feeding tube it's there to to deliver the medication and Sometimes you have to educate the hospitals. Oh, I had a that. horrible time with them, yeah, because well, they wanted to use the port that the medicine goes in, and I, I, to, I fought with them. I said no, and I called the company twice because I kept telling them what the company because they had never seen this before, and I didn't want them to screw it up. And I, I actually called the company twice, and I, and they, they even made a, a, a kludgy looking thing that they were determined to give him two feedings. And I had a really fight with the doctor, and I finally said, you know, and, and thank God they listened, and because the, you cannot use that medicine port for that, you would have ruined it. If, you know, wow. it, it, so it was very frustrating because they just wouldn't listen to me, you know. And I, so I'm trying to call Abby, and it's like, oh my gosh, it was very frustrating. But we made it through. That's actually one reason why the, uh, the port that the medicine goes in is different not just because it somehow needs to be that way for the pump, 
but because you're not supposed to hook other things up to that port. And there's a, a regular port that you use for feeding, so I'm not sure why they... Uh, oh, you know why? Because that was the time it was leaking, and uh -huh. they thought the stomach was leaking, so they didn't want to put it into the stomach. Uh -huh. They wanted to use the jejunum port, but that's uh -huh. the medicine port. Got it. And because they could, they could bypass the stomach. That, yeah. that was the issue. So I finally told him, if he had if he had abdominal surgery, you would wait till he had bowel sounds. He can go a few days without eating he, or getting, because mm -hmm. they wanted to feed him because he couldn't eat. It was frustrating, but we survived anyway. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> you really have to be your own advocate sometime because people don't understand because no, they had not seen this. And, yeah. and, the, and the pharmacy had to approve it before we could give it. Mm -hmm. And they, all, they, they were all, they hadn't even seen it, so they were going through, but it, it worked out. But, so the mechanics of the device, is that something, is, is he unable to do that? Is that something you're helping him with? Is well, it, Steve also has dementia with his right. Parkinson's, okay. and he's not able to, to, to so I do, I take care of it. I know. Yeah. He had with Parkinson's, and his wife has had a bad stroke, so. Yeah. yeah, so I just take care of it. I, I have another patient where the patient mm -hmm. can hook it up the, themselves yeah. fine. Um, we were a little bit concerned that they'd be too off overnight to hook it up in the morning, but I think we're doing okay with that. So, And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's still fairly new therapy in the U.S. so that uh, you do run into lots of people in hospitals and so forth who just haven't seen it before. Um, I will put in a plug that, uh, like so many things, it actually has been used for, I think, more than a decade in Europe. So it's not like it's uh, really that experimental. There's a lot of experience with using it. Um, but uh, it's going to take a while for uh, uh, particularly uh, hospital providers who don't usually even deal with that many Parkinson's patients to, to get used to the idea of some of these things. So. Yes? What about insurance coverage? Did you have to fight for that? Maybe you know, <laughs> we didn't. It was it was approved. They called us, because I was concerned when they first talked about it, because I looked up online and it's very expensive. And it turns out, Steve is on Medicare, and they they pay for infusion medication. And so, and it's very, it is very expensive, but it's, co it's covered 100%. We have that, and we have a, um, a Plan G, secondary insurance. So between the two, we don't pay a cent, fortunately. And so from my point of view as a physician, yes, there's nothing you can do these days that you don't sometimes have to fight with the insurance company to do it. But it does seem to be, in most cases, uh, possible to, to get it approved by the insurance. Yes? So I I'm a nurse practitioner, so my question is, is internally, is did you say one goes to the stomach and one goes to the jejunum? Actually, I think it goes down to the duodenum. Duodenum. Hence the, the duo part of the duo but. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I get it. <laughs> yeah. um, so it, it gets it uh, beyond the stomach to an area where the uh, uh, levodopa is very well absorbed. Um, Okay. And you don't have to, you've got less concern about it getting back into the stomach and regurg and so forth. And then the, the, like I say, there are two ports and the other one opens up, I think actually right into the stomach. But okay, so does it have to be uh, installed by a physician that's already, like a interventional radiologist who's already familiar with doing yeah, these or? Anybody who installs peg tubes should be able to do it. Uh, and again, many people who do are not familiar with this already. So, but usually if you get them in contact with the company that uh, produces the pump and so forth, they can mm -hmm. tell them what kind of tubes and special considerations about getting it positioned in the right place and so forth. So. Okay. Oh, and even when we were at the, at the hospital for the insertion, there is a representative right from the drug company who's there, and she comes in, she sees you, she goes into the procedure with the doctor, and then she comes out. So she, then she, and that's, that's what her job is, she goes to all this. So, and even when he was in the hospital, they came and we saw her, she came there also. You know, so she's, she really keeps in touch with you. And if you have any questions, you can call them at any time, which is nice, yeah. Yeah, the, the company that makes the pumps is very concerned that they want to make sure that they're set up right because mm -hmm. otherwise they're not going to work right and 
they provide a lot of support. So they're very good in that way. Any other questions? Are you finding that it's more readily available for the insurance versus going to Ridery or, I mean, because you had said that you didn't really get that covered. Um, yeah, the numbers aren't equal. There are a lot of people I've tried to get Ridery for. A very small percentage, some of that actually successfully gotten Ridery. Um, every patient, now there's only been, uh, uh, I think, four patients that I've gone the Duopo route with, um, but we have never not done it because insurance wouldn't cover it. So, um, like I say, there may be some pushback, but it's doable. Um, the, uh, I'm not quite sure why there's exactly so much resistance to, to writery, which is also very expensive, but as mentioned, the, the gel cartridges for the pump are quite expensive as well, so. And all the rest of the care that's involved, you would think. Yeah, um, but uh, yeah, it's one of those things I think the insurance companies anticipate and not incorrectly so if I had my druthers, I'd just use Ritery because why would you use a short-acting stuff? Um, yeah, you can get away with it and it's cheaper, but medically there's no advantage to using short-acting stuff with the time-release capsule available. Um, so uh, I think they fear a stampede to the expense of Ritery, whereas they don't uh, have that sense with this kind of therapy. But. Uh, uh, in the long run. <laughs> Another comparison that's always uh, often made is the uh, expense of uh, this compared to uh, the deep brain stimulator, which is an alternative for uh, people who are good candidates for that. And of course, once the deep brain stimulator is in, until the battery in it in the device runs down, there's no great expense in maintaining it. On the other hand, the expense of uh, the surgeries to implant the wires and implant a deep brain stimulator and the implanted device itself is quite expensive. Um, the expense of putting in one of these tubes is relatively low uh, as surgical things go. Um, so the, uh, the expenses uh, for, uh, you know, say, a five to six year battery life on a DBS unit, the expense is all up front. Um, but it's actually pretty comparable <coughs> to maintaining somebody on the gel cartridges for five or six years. So, I don't know, um, uh, did, did you all consider deep brain stimulation? Or well, we were told because of his dementia he was yeah. not a candidate. Yeah, he was already beginning to uh, dement at that point, which is, um, yeah, there's a real risk with uh, implanting wires in the brain if there's already some cognitive decline of really accelerating it and you don't want to do that. And that's probably the most common reason for, for not doing deep brain stimulators. But as, as I mentioned in an earlier talk, there can be other reasons why people um, can't undergo that kind of surgery and they can easily undergo this uh, tube emplacement because it's so simple. <coughs> Any other questions? Anything else you no, want to tell people? No, I think we're good. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, I don't think we've used up all our time, but. Uh, Where's the cruise? <laughs> we get. Oh, Mediterranean. Oh, wonderful. I never thought I'd cruise, and we went out. We got a, a good deal from AAA. We went out, and I loved it. So now, that, that's our goal. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the great things about uh, being able to do this sort of thing. I think it's fair to say you would never consider going on the cruise if you hadn't had the uh, no, no, surgery. No, no, yeah. no. So people can really live a, a much better and uh, Oh, even uh, the last life. cruise we went on, he froze in the airport. And, the, and then we had to wait, because we, were, we thought we'd be on time, and then they said, oh, we'll get a wheelchair. Well, then you have to stay in line and wait. We almost missed the plane. I was, so, I was like having a heart attack. <laughs> but, so this, this will be much better. Okay, well, thank you all for your attention. Thank you.